Good morning. Welcome to Colonial Heights United Methodist Church. Whether you're worshiping with us online or in person, we are so glad that you are worshiping with us, and we are a blessed, blessed congregation. Last night, we got to do drive through Trunk or Treat with Dogwood Elementary. It was very different. All the adults had on the mask, and the kids got the candy in the car. <laughs> but it went very well. We gave out about 400 pieces of candy, and so we've got about 400 left if anybody's hungry. Those, those will go in the Thanksgiving baskets, and Don is working out the details. We will do Thanksgiving baskets again this year. Those will be packed by family groups so that we stay safe and have our mask on. We'll also do the meal. It'll be prepared by two people, then packed somewhere else by others, and then delivered to Montgomery Village, Isabel Towers, and we'll have a drive-through here at the church that will be able to hand out those Thanksgiving meals. So uh, please be watching the newsletter for more information about how you can participate. And we are, I believe, planning to do an angel tree of some sort, um, whether that looks like gift cards for some and buying for others. We still want to be able to help the children in our area have as good a Christmas as possible. So I think those are all of our announcements at this time. Oh, let's just take a moment and a deep breath. Father God, center us in your spirit. Ground us in your word. Break us open so that what breaks your heart breaks ours. In the name and the power of Jesus Christ. Amen.
we go to the Lord in prayer. We want to remember all of those who are sick and recovering from surgery. We learn of new cases of COVID every day. We've learned of one this morning. And we just ask that you would continue to be in prayer. Our dear Lisa continues to make modest improvements. She is now breathing on her own. So that is a huge leap. It is a huge leap. And we ask that God would continue to bring healing in her body as she progresses. And we pray. We pray for our nation. We pray for people to be united. We pray that we would come together as Christians. And rather than find ways to divide, we would find things that we have in common. Because you all have got really cute masks, too. Let's pray. God, in a world that continues to divide and separate into this rugged individualism, you call us to be community. Today, as we observe All Saints Day, it is a reminder that we are part of that great cloud of witnesses that have gone before and that will come after us. We are part of something greater than ourselves. We are called to something greater than our own interests. Lord, open our hearts that we might feel for the other. Open our eyes that we would see the other. Lord, give us ears to hear one another. Give us quiet souls to be still and know that you are God and that we are not, that we are followers of Jesus and he has taught us how to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
All Saints Sunday, since once a year we remember those of our members who have gone on to be with the Lord, who have received their reward and now in glory. The author of Hebrews wrote, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer, pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Today, we remember Nancy Pierce. Nancy dreamed of being a midwife, and what she found that is through life she became a midwife in ways that she never expected. She was a midwife to artists and musicians bringing birth. She was a midwife in fabrics and textiles as she quilted and sewed. She was a midwife in ways that she never expected or planned. My favorite story about Nancy was the lesson in cookies. Nancy's grandfather was well over 120 years old. She still had his cookie cutters for over 120 years. But they were taught to make cookies each Christmas for the needy children in town. They used those cookie cutters every year, she and her sisters and siblings. And they would take the cookies to those in town the whole cookies. You see, Nancy and her brothers and sisters were only allowed to eat the broken ones because it was the poor who got the whole cookies. Imagine teaching children to give their very best to those that the world hardly sees at all. Today we light a candle and ring a bell and we remember Nancy Pierce and the way that she midwifed life into our congregation and to those that she loved. We also remember Cy Wills. Cy had four loves, Carolyn, Colonial Heights Church, Drums, and the Scouts. When we look at Cy's legacy, it is his legacy and love for the scouting ministry in this church that he is most remembered for. And we give God thanks and praise that he felt called to serve the young men in our area and to the lives that he touched. Lord, in your mercy, we remember the life and legacy of Cy Wills. And while we have not lost anyone in our congregation to COVID, we light this candle to remember 226,000 lives. Doctors and nurses, medical technicians, teachers, ordinary people going about their lives. We remember them and declare that their lives made a difference in this world.
like to share with you the prayer. This comes from our brothers and sisters of the Lutheran Church of Australia today. Let us pray. God has raised Jesus Christ to sit at his right hand. Let us therefore pray to our Father in heaven through his Son for all the world and all of the saints. O oh God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for calling us your saints. In spite of our unholy lives, you look at us and see Jesus' perfect life and death covering ours. Thank you for this grace. Thank you for every Christian who has helped us on our journey and encouraged us to keep believing when we felt like giving up. Thank you for all those who taught us the faith. Thank you for those who made the ultimate sacrifice of their lives to ensure that others could hear of your love in Christ. We remember the saints in heaven. We thank you for releasing them from the burden of sin and death in this life and for keeping your promise to them. Give comfort to all of those who grieve for their loved ones this day. Give them the hope that only your word can offer us. We pray this day for your church on earth, that it would remain faithful to the apostles' teachings, that it would strive for unity. We pray for all Christians, especially those under persecution, that they would imitate the martyrs in a bold witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray for those who are not yet part of your church and for those who have left it, asking your spirit to convince them of your love for them Jesus. We pray for the enemies of the church and those who curse your saints. We ask that you would bring peace to all nations as we are in conflict and divided where there is political instability. We ask your grounding and ask you to protect all of those who are poor and hungry. Give them hope. Move those of us with plenty to share to those who have little. Help all people to love their neighbor as themselves. God of life, we give you thanks for the love that you have shown to the world through all of your saints this day. And we celebrate the continuing communion with them whenever we worship. We look forward to being part of that great crowd of witnesses by your throne in heaven. And in the meantime, keep us looking to Jesus. Help us to keep giving a clear witness to him, living the holy lives that you called us to live by the power of your Holy Spirit. It is in through the name and power of your son, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen. Micah was a prophet that lived in the late 8th century BCE, and he speaks at a time when there was no shortage of religious folks. The problem was that was the religious leaders and the political leaders tend to love their own power in themselves more than the least of these. They were not looking after the widows and orphans as God had commanded them. God sends his messenger, a farmer, Micah, to warn them of what would happen if they continued on this path. In these verses in chapter 6, it sounds like a courtroom, and that's exactly what it's intended to. God lodges a case against Israel, calling all of creation, the mountains and the hills, are to act as the jury. The very foundation of the earth will hear God's charges and Israel's plea. Hear what the Lord says. Rise, plead your case before the mountains and let your hills hear your voice. Hear you mountains, the controversy of the Lord and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a controversy with his people and he will contend with Israel. Oh, my people, what have I done to you? In what have I wearied you? Answer me. 
For I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember now what King Balak of Moab devised? What Balaam, son of Beor, answered him? And what happened from Shittim to Gilgal? That you may know the saving acts of the Lord. Micah responds for the people. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with the calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with a thousand rams, with ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? This is the word of God for the people of God. What binds people together? What brings people together and keeps them together as a people? Is it where they live? Do all the people in your neighborhood stay in one spot and stay bound together? Is it that they all look alike? Is it blood ties that bind people together forever? Is it believing the same things? You see, I chose an unusual passage for All Saints Sunday. And I chose it because I believe what binds people together is having a common goal having a common mission, a common purpose, a reason above their own selves, something higher than themselves to give their lives to. God's people, chosen, blessed, and holy, have a reason, a purpose for being, a common goal that's been our mission since the beginning of time. We share that with Moses, with Micah, with Jesus, with Peter, with Paul, we share it with Martin Luther, with John Wesley, with Martin Luther King Jr., with Mother Teresa. We share it with Barbara Thornton, Nancy Pierce, Cy Will, the beautiful family that gave the money to the, for the humble building, all those who've gone in this place before us, people around the world that we do not know and will never meet. We are bound to them by a common mission, stated better by Micah than I believe anywhere else. This is what we are to do, to do justice. This is how we are to do it, love kindness. And that doesn't mean love kind things. It's, the word is hesed, and it's, there's no English word that really translates hesed because it is lifelong, never-ending, loving loyalty. It is the love that God has for people. Lifelong loving loyalty, that's how we are to love. That's how we're to do justice. And why are we to do it? It's that humble walk with God, which means God gives the glory, not us. We are God's people. It is God's mission to do justice, to walk humbly, and to love with a lifelong loyalty. When I was at Emory going to school to be a pastor, I got to serve as a chaplain at Children's Hospital at Emory in Atlanta. And one morning I was with a very cute 12 year old. Now, Sarah, as I will call her, had had a kidney transplant and she was having to go back for surgery and have a stent put in. And when I arrived in her room, she had already had Verset. Verset, if you don't know, is like a Valium. It doesn't knock them out. It just makes them a little loopy until they get downstairs to surgery. And Sarah was well into loopy. She was seeing two of everything. And she would laugh. And she had her mother and grandmother and me laughing because everything she saw, she'd say she saw two of them. So I explained to Sarah that I was a chaplain and that was like a pastor that I worked in the hospital and I was there to learn from her and that we were gonna have prayer together if that was okay with her. 
And as I bent down over her bed to have prayer, she reached up, took my cock, got real serious. She said, so this is what you do. So this is what you do. I have never been able to measure up to Sarah's expectations of me. But what Sarah was saying was because I wore a cock, she had certain expectations. She expected me to act like Jesus. She expected me to do justice, to love kindly, to be walking humbly with God. You see, Sarah in the world has expectations of us to do justice, to walk humbly with God, and to live lifelong in that loyalty of loving kindness to others. The world doesn't just expect it. God requires it. We heard in the two names that we read this morning, people who had fulfilled that mission you see, our doing justice and walking humbly with God and showing Hesed the other doesn't always come out the way we think it's going to. We think we're going to be a midwife or a drummer in a rock band, and we end up leading, leading a group of scouts or midwifing new life into people. In Scripture, the word for justice is the same exact word as righteous. It means that those who are called to be God's people are to stand up for the widow, the orphan, the foreigner in our midst, and all those who are oppressed. In other words, people who have power lorded over them, who have no power of their own, and you can step in and make a difference. I believe that was Martin Luther King Jr.'s definition of power, is the ability to make a difference. Isn't that a wonderful definition for power? Who doesn't have power? The question is, how do we use it? Do we use it to lord over people, or do we use it to come alongside with people? Have you ever thought that one of the reasons that God favors and blesses the least, the last, and the lost, those who are living in oppressive conditions, is that when you live in oppressive conditions, ultimately the oppressor forces themselves upon you to be your God. When you're poor and hungry and your children are starving to death, despite the fact that you are working, 40 hours a week. Those in power who desire more profit, who put the weight on the laborers, you become their slave. You can't stand up to bad behavior if you know that your job depends on it, can you? You can't afford to lose your job. You can't afford to get more education for a better job. You can't take off work to go look for a higher paying job. In other words, you are at the mercy of those who have power over you. I hadn't thought about my little friend Sarah in a long time. That was at least 12 years ago, so Sarah is by now out of college. She's probably out looking for a job. Now let's suppose Sarah goes to employer A, and employer A needs somebody to work 30 hours a week. That's the work, and that's what it's going to take, and Sarah considers the position. She goes on to in interview with Employer B. Now, Employer B really needs a full-time person. They need somebody to work 40 hours a week. But HR has been given the directive from those above them that the profits are not coming in the way they need to. So no more hiring full-time employees, regardless of the job. You hire them for 30 hours a week so that the corporation doesn't have to pay them health insurance or retirement, and that makes the bottom line look better. Is that justice? Case A, I would argue that it is. They only need somebody 30 hours. They legitimately just have a 30-hour-a-week job. 
In the second case, they need full-time workers. It's a full-time job, but they're avoiding taking care of the employee, paying her health insurance or retirement benefits in order that their profits will look good to the shareholders. Is that justice? Settle that in your mind right now. Is it justice? Now things just get complicated. You're the human resource director at that company. What do you do? Do you hire Sarah for a full-time job and not give her benefits? that other full-time employees receive in order to make the bottom line look better. Well, Rhonda, aren't profits important? How can companies exist if they don't make money? And after all, my boss told me to do it. It must be okay. That's where the Christian life becomes a little more complicated. Because then what was very clear, I would say, in most people's minds as injustice, we rationalize and make it okay. That's what happens. And it sneaks in and it devours us. That's just a small example of what happens every day. In Micah's day, the issue was using incorrect, faulty weights. You know, what matters if it's off a little? You know, the scales aren't exactly right, but hey, it's more profit to the bottom line. That's okay, my boss is happy. You go to the butcher and you order two pounds of chicken and the butcher holds that chicken on there with his thumb just a little bit heavier than he needs to. It's just a quarter pound. It weighs a pound and three quarters and you've asked for two it's just a quarter pound, and the boss needs the money, and if he doesn't get the money, he's not going to have his business, and he's going to shut the store down, and you're going to be without a job. See, it gets just a little sticky and a little complicated. And then before you know it, it gets out of hand. We are called to do justice. To do it, not to talk about it, but to do it. We have to see with the eyes of God and keep putting those eyes on like a pair of glasses every single day. Am I participating in justice? Or am I contributing to the injustice in the world? Am I not taking a stand when I see injustice? Am I allowing myself to to be swayed in any way where that it is not seeking the welfare of those that God has called me, requires me. That's a strong word. For grace that's given freely, it's a strong word that God says, that Micah says to them. God requires of his people to do justice to love kindness, and to walk humbly with God. It's hard to imagine ourselves in that courtroom with Micah that day. What might the charges be for us in 2020? What might it feel like knowing in that courtroom that everything the judge is saying, everything that's being brought up, we know that we are guilty. And then the one with all the evidence looks at us and says, now will you spend the rest of your life with me, loving me as I love you? It's what God has done in Christ. It is what binds us together. It's what makes us the communion of saints. As God has given us, us a mission and a purpose in this world. And we live it out in very unique ways. We're not all called to be Mother Teresa or Martin Luther King Jr. 
but we are called to be who God has uniquely created us to be. Whether that is making cookies and eating the broken ones and taking the whole ones downtown to Carm, or whether it's coming alongside the sick and praying with them, showing compassion. Each of us have a different way to be the saint that God has called us to be in this world. Now I know in this moment, there is high anxiety all around us. What's going to happen on Tuesday? What's going to happen on Tuesday? Can I tell you something? Yesterday, today, and tomorrow, God is going to require the exact same thing of us on Wednesday morning as he is on Tuesday morning as he did 2,500 years ago, speaking through the voice of Micah. What happens on Tuesday night is important. Our world is going to be different no matter what the outcome. But our mission, our purpose in the world will not change. What God is requiring us of us on Wednesday morning is not going to change. To do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. You are part of something much bigger than yourself. That should give you a sense of purpose. It should put a smile on your face, calm all of your anxiety, because you know what's required. We are going to observe this very holy meal, which reminds us that we are bound together. I will this week be reading the communion liturgy and doing all the parts once again as we remain safe. You have your sealed communion with you if you would like to go ahead and get that out as you're able. As I offer this invitation, Christ, who is our Lord, invites to his table all those who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, seek to live in peace with one another. As we confess our sin before God and each other, this is our, all of our confession. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We've broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, who is our Lord. Amen. This is the good news of Jesus Christ given for all. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are a forgiven people. And our great Thanksgiving is a special one for this day. The Lord be with us all. We lift up our hearts to the Lord and we give thanks to our Lord, our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise to God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, God of Abraham and Sarah, God of Miriam and Moses, God of Joshua and Deborah, God of Ruth and David, God of the priests and the prophets, God of Mary and Joseph, God of the apostles and the martyrs, God of our mothers and our fathers, God of our children to all generations. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, God, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. It is by his baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection that you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread, he gave thanks to you, he broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, he gave thanks to you, he gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. See, this is who we are called to be, the body of Christ. And like the body of Christ, we are broken and then given to the world. The blood of Christ that was poured out for the forgiveness of sins, that God's requirement to do justice to love kindness and to walk humbly with God comes from our heart, out of a heart of love for God, the Father Almighty, and our neighbor and ourself. No longer on a tablet of stone. When that supper was over, Jesus took the cup. He gave thanks to you, and excuse me, when that supper was over, yeah, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is the blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of our faith, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Jesus Christ so that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood, by your Spirit, Make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. May we partake of the cup of the new covenant. Let us pray. God, we give you thanks for this holy meal on this very high and holy special day as we remember all the saints that have gone before us. We thank you that we are bound to them and all those to come through your mission in the world. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
May God's grace sustain you in the coming days. May God's love hold you in the coming days. And may God's requirement motivate you in the coming days that you would have the peace and knowledge that you are God's beloved child. Amen. Thank you.